fancy word for interpreting what we read is called hermeneutics. <clears throat> One of the ways that we can read scripture and interpret it is through an analytical <clears throat> sort of perspective. So the analysis can give us context and perspective. And there are some really interesting things about this passage. So these, you know, we sing everything. We three kings of Orient are. Well, scholars say that actually there's probably somewhere between seven and twelve of these men who came. We use three because they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But there was anywhere from seven to twelve of these men that came. And who were these wise men from the east? Well, that word wise in the Greek is the word magi. And I don't know uh, how familiar you are with history, but about six to 500 BC, you had the Babylonian Empire was ruling the world with Nebuchadnezzar until Darius the Persian king came down and took Babylon. And then Alexander the Great went into Persia and subdued Persia. And so Persia is where these magi are from. Alexander the Great goes there. He learns from them. They actually had an amiable relationship. And he brings back to Greece this term magi, which we find here translated in our English Bibles as wise. But really, literally, magi means, it's where we get the word magician. These were seers and mystics. And how did they know these seers and mystics? Because they didn't have the Hebrew Bible. How did they know how to come looking for Jesus? How did they know that? Logic? No. Education? You must have had Reason? connection with some kind of higher being. Okay, and that higher being connection. How, what were they following to find Jesus? A star. They were astronomers. Well, I think there must have been something other than just astronomers. Sure. I mean, astronomers see stars and planets all the time, but we don't always connect them with something. So these were spiritual seeking men who read the signs of God in the sky and followed this light to the place where Jesus was. I think these stories become so familiar we don't really pay attention to what's being said here. So when they get to Jerusalem, and this is quickly, this is the context, but when they get to Jerusalem, they're like, okay, we followed the, uh, uh, the star. We, 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 we saw that the, the king of the Jews was going to be born, but what, like where? So they go to Jerusalem, not Bethlehem. And who do they, they talk to? They talk to the scholars and the religious leaders of Jerusalem. And they say, we know, where is this going to be? And that's what we quoted here. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler. They were quoting from the Old Testament book, of Micah, this prophecy. So this is the context, and it's, it's an amazing story, and of course, Herod gets afraid because this is a threat to his power, and anytime we feel our power is threatened, we get afraid, and, and we want to control, and we want to fix. So he tries to control and fix, and uh, he, he wants to actually kill this, this baby, but we, we find that out later, when he has every baby under two taken away. So that's the analysis. So a lot of people, they, that's that's Bible study. Okay, we read that, yeah, they came from there, that's the history. Okay, Persia, where the kids it's about 15,000 kilometers. But that could be important, 15,000 kilometers away. Because when we move into the spiritual side of the story, when we read the scriptures, not with a head that is analyzing the facts, but with a heart that is saying, God, what are you saying to me? And we step back and we realize 
Christ, as St. Augustine said in the 4th century, God wrote two books, the Bible and nature. You can read about him in either one. What is the picture in nature teaching us this morning? So if those wise men, scholars say that it would have taken them about 18 months by camel to make this journey, following a star, when can you see a star? Only in the night. Only in the darkness? Only in the darkness. Only in the not knowing. Only in the not controlling. Only in the not fixing. Only in the not understanding. Are we attentive to a guiding light in a way that we wouldn't be when the sun is shining and the air is warm and all our ducks are in a row and we don't really care to pay attention. So what is your darkness this morning? Thank you for being brave enough to share. That's real. I know the stories of a lot of you here this morning and those in our community, and I know that there is this darkness that is part of our human journey. For those of you who couldn't hear, she's still in a state of shock. While we stand with you, Joe. Virginia McGilvery shared out at Advocate this morning. She doesn't know this is her husband's third bout of cancer, and it doesn't look good right now, and he's in lots of pain. And you know, this, this is the picture. So something else happens when it gets dark. Not only can we see the guiding light that we couldn't see in the daytime, but all of the stuff that we often focus on in the daytime becomes a silhouette at best, or a shadow. And that's what Virginia was saying. You know what, all that matters to me is the love that I get to share now with my husband. Not the business, not the trucks, not her son losing. This love that I get to share with my husband. Because I can't see all that other stuff right now. I see what actually really matters. So I want to make this statement in the context of what you just said shared, Joe, and not making this statement in a light way at all. But I know that sometimes we need the darkness to see the light. I know that's 
that's a short sentence. And it sounds pretty simple. But it goes really deep. Sometimes we need the darkness to see the light. So on this Epiphany Sunday, the light that guided the Magi to Jerusalem and this is interesting so we're traveling for 18 months you're the nobleman of your country the learned wise sages who are revered and you're going to find this king of the Jews that that, that you've been seeking and, and, and reading in the stars and it, the, the very stars themselves and you get to, where would you go? Of course you would go to the capital, you would go to Jerusalem and you would talk to all of their noblemen and their scribes and you would ask, okay, where is this king that's going to be born, king of the Jews? And they, they read this prophecy from Micah to this little town of Bethlehem and off they go to Bethlehem and the light guides them again, so it had to be night again, and they get to Bethlehem, and they don't find a king's court, they don't find a noble family, they find this poor, socially unimpressive, marginalized family and an 18-month-old child. This is their epiphany. Sometimes the star doesn't guide you to where you think it should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need the darkness to see the star, but sometimes the star doesn't guide us to where we think it should. But these, however, spiritual enlightenment, these men, these wise, noble men humbled themselves, it says, fell on their knees and worshipped this 18-month-old baby of this poor family. Because what they saw was the presence of the divine in human flesh and blood. What they saw was the presence of the divine in human flesh and blood. Joe, I don't know what God's going to do for your body. And of course, we're going to pray with you. We're going to journey with you. We're going to be there with you. I don't know. But I do know God's presence is with you mm -hmm. and in you. And he can give you a peace that passes understanding, however dark the circumstances. That's the hope. That's the power of hope. That's the promise of hope. That's the surety of hope. I can't give you the surety of physical healing, but I can give you the surety of God's presence with him. Christ in you, the hope of glory, who gives us peace that passes understanding. So my prayer is that as we come to partake of communion this morning, that we, like the wise men, the Magi, would be humble enough to recognize and accept the presence of God calling out to us to be embraced as our hope 
is participating in God's presence and nature. So Julie, can we play this communion song just before we take it in? Number 460. Oh, bummer. <laughs> 